Good evening, everyone. I'm Elizabeth George, Chief Membership Officer with the American Guild of Organists, and I'm so happy that you could join us tonight for a very, very special webinar that uh, is really, I think, going to resonate with a lot of you, being yourself in the spotlight of public ministry. Before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of housekeeping notes. You are muted, but we do want to hear from you. So please post your questions in the Q&A icon that is at the bottom of your screen. And when Sarah has finished her presentation, we're going to address those. The second thing is this is being recorded tonight and uh, probably within the next 48 hours, it will uh, be uploaded onto our website and we will send an email out so that everybody who didn't have a chance to view tonight will be able to. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Sarah Bariza is a lifelong church musician who currently serves as director of music at St. Grace United Methodist Church in St. Louis. She holds a bachelor's degree in organ performance, multiple master's degrees, and a PhD in musicology. Sarah is chairing the new music committee for the 2026 AGO National Convention, which will be in St. Louis. She's author of Professional Christian, Being Fully Yourself in the Spotlight of Christian Ministry. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, Sarah Bariza. I am so delighted to be with you all tonight. Um, in our presentation tonight, I'll be talking for about 30 minutes and then we will have Q&A at the end. A little bit more about me that um, informs this presentation is that I have worked in a really wide range of denominations. I And my values have changed as, as I have um, grown and changed over the years. I grew up in a very conservative Baptist family and pro ministered in various evangelical denominations, various mainline denominations, in recent years in Ohio, I worked in a Presbyterian church and an Episcopal church. And then here in St. Louis, I have worked at a congregational church and I'm now ministering in a Methodist church for the first time, which is a lot of fun. I grew up taking piano lessons from a UMC lady and now I'm now I'm here back at back in the Methodist church. Um, another thing that influences uh, this presentation tonight um, is when I was doing research for my book, this might be backwards for you, professional Christian, being fully yourself in the spotlight of public ministry. Um, I interviewed a wide range of people. I interviewed about 50 people, uh, clergy, lay people, teachers, nonprofit leaders, staff in churches, staff in schools, staff in religious nonprofits, just a wide range of people about their perspectives on being themselves in ministry. So when I'm speaking about this topic, Absolutely, I'm influenced by like my own personality, my own preferences, my own values. But I'm also thinking about this from that wide range of viewpoint, people who've had a lot of different experiences than I have, people who are ministering in denominations that are, um, you know, a priest in a Roman Catholic church has a very different perspective on being fully himself in public ministry versus a uh, fem female clergy in a progressive Presbyterian church. Those are very different perspectives on how to be oneself. And so when I'm speaking tonight, I'm coming from that, uh, coming from that uh, knowledge base of having talked with a really wide range of people about their experiences. One thing that I want to focus in on particularly tonight as Elizabeth and I were um, planning this session, I was thinking about the workspaces that we are in very specifically, as opposed to talking about social media or talking about how our families intersect with our jobs. One thing that we're gonna focus in on tonight is how our workplaces influence our abilities to be ourselves and how those workplaces, how we can evaluate those workplaces before we even start working there. And um, some of this is geared towards people who are um, beginning as professional musicians. Um, beginning as church musicians, synagogue musicians, school teachers, um, as opposed to people who are later in their careers. But I hope that for those of you who are later in your career, I hope that you will also find this to be an informative space for you and a, a generative space for you to think about how you interact with your, your professional sphere. So let's, let's dive in. I want to start by thinking about a metaphor for 
what it means to be yourself in a public space, specifically the public space in which most of us organists minister. Church, synagogue, school, those are generally the places that we are um, likely to be employed. Here's the metaphor. It's of a crescent moon. So if you're looking out at the evening sky or maybe the daytime sky, and you see that little sliver of the moon, you're seeing a real and true part of the moon. And that's what you can see. You can't see the rest of the moon. You're just seeing the sliver. But the whole rest of the moon is there in 3D, right? There's a huge amount of the moon that we can't see. And in fact, we never even see like the dark side of the moon from our perspective on earth. There's a huge amount that we don't see in that crescent. And I think that that is very similar to how our relationship of ourself, who we are, how that relates to our uh, relationships with people in, our, in the space in which we work, the church, the school, the synagogue. When people see us in those spaces, they are hopefully seeing something that is real and true and fully and honestly ourselves. Ideally, we would hope that that would be the case, that we are full of integrity and honesty. And those folks are never going to see all of us. They can't see all of us. I mean, I, I think that even, even the people who are closest to us, our best friends, our spouses, our lifelong partners, they don't even see the whole of who we are. Maybe we don't even see the whole of who we are. But they see a lot more than the folks that we work with, whether they're the volunteers, the students, uh, the co-workers, the people who we're working with professionally, who see this in this spotlight of public ministry, they're only seeing a very, very small sliver of who we are. If you, uh, for instance, if you work with children, you know that they are just floored to see you in the grocery store because they can't imagine you out of that little sliver of who they see in, in their music classroom, right? And that also goes for many people, say volunteers in a church who might see you in a different setting and just can't imagine that you're not exactly the same as they see you um, in choir rehearsal or exactly the way that they see you on Sunday in Sunday morning, which is of course a kind of, I mean, there's naivete, naivete there, but it's also just human nature that we think, okay, well, what we see is what we get. And it's hard for us to imagine like the whole of the person there or just remember that that whole person is there. Um, but we know that. We know that when we show up in these professional settings that we're bringing that professional slice of who we are. Again, not because we're dishonest, not because we're dis disintegrated with ourselves, not because we are hiding something, but because we're in a professional setting where people are seeing a specific part of us and where specific slice of who we are is is what we bring to work and that's a really important part of who we are but it's not the whole thing so when we're thinking about doing that in ministry spaces there are things that make it very difficult to show up as ourselves in the sliver that people see us so we've got all of ourselves and we've got this small slice that people are seeing in our um, our ministry spaces our workspaces and because of our role in nonprofits, and I'm thinking specifically religious nonprofits, and I realize some of us are probably uh, working in a secular setting, but for the most part, I'm thinking about people who are um, working in religious settings um, or religious nonprofits. Um, there are layers added onto that professionalism that make it very difficult uh, for us to show up as ourselves or just add nuance to who we are as we show up as ourselves. I, I have like eight different, eight different angles on this. Why is this, why is this so particularly uniquely difficult for us? Here's one reason. People who are in, in the United States, people who are employed in religious settings can be hired and fired on those religious standards of the organization. Um, this isn't the case across the world, but it's certainly the case in the United States at where the American Guild of Organists is based. And um, that can be extremely tricky for people and historically has been very tricky for people. So when we zoom in specifically on how to evaluate uh, potential employers, that's something that we're going to look at 
very closely because clergy who are then working in re religious spaces with religious employers, clergy are trained to think about all of this and to really think carefully about like what particular flavor of Presbyterian they want to be. Most of us on the music side of things, this is just not what we think about. We're thinking about like, you know, getting, getting the Bach uh, technique just, just so, right? We're thinking about our, our paddle technique. We're not thinking about how do we line up with this particular flavor of Presbyterian, right? So we're gonna come, come back to that because it is a huge, has a huge impact on our ability to be ourselves in the space where we're employed. So we can be hired and fired uh, based on our religious, uh, religious standards of the organization where we work. Um, and depending on where we work, we may also be expected to be a faith representative. Not all of us work in spaces where we're expected to adhere to the particular uh, religion or religious beliefs of where we work, but many of us do. And if we are in that kind of setting, people who we work with may look at us as uh, being a role model um, or in some way being someone to look up to in a, in a spiritual sense that we maybe were a good, a good person, right? And that we should be, should be uh, in this kind of way because like, well, we're the minister of music and the minister of music should be this kind of thing. Well, we're the, the teacher at the, the parish school. And if you're the teacher at the parish school, well, you need to be uh, a role model for these, these kids. Another reason it's difficult is that we may not really know what it means to be ourselves. That gets into like self-knowledge, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, it, it, it can be difficult because we may not know what to share in that public slice of who we are in that like crescent moon space. How do we, what, what do we want to share? And it may feel dishonest to think about it. Uh, many of us are raised with an understanding, uh, cultural understanding of authenticity that is very present, that we're just spontaneous, that we just are who we are. Um, and we just, whatever emotions show up, those are the ones that we display, whatever feelings we have, whatever thoughts we have um, in a kind of unfiltered way, we just share them. That can get us into a lot of trouble. Um, but if we think, if we have like more forethought, if we uh, hold back a little bit and think, okay, now what, what do I want to do? how do I want, want to act in this setting? Um, we may feel like that's being dishonest just by the act of thinking about it. Um, thinking about uh, relationships that we have, people that we work with, our coworkers, volunteers that we work with, bosses, managers, clergy, um, people may be very naive about this narrowness in who we are, this slice of who we are in that ministry space. Um, and they may think that because they see us all the time that they have a very close uh, relationship with us. And yes, they may have a very close relationship with us, but it's not the same thing. Um, I think uh, norms around this have changed over the generations. Uh, maybe 50 years ago, the relationships between say, me as a minister of music with say a choir member, maybe those would be different could be different 50 years ago than they are now. And some of this also depends on denomination and just a whole host of things. But generally speaking, we may have a certain kind of close relationship with the people that we're ministering with and do. But generally speaking, it's not the same as like them being our best buddies. Um, another reason this can be really difficult is that in these spaces where we're ministering to and with other people, especially thinking about students, especially thinking about church members or synagogue members. Um, we are having to negotiate other people's needs all the time. And we're having to do that regardless of our own feelings. So for instance, I show up uh, to choir rehearsal. I'm an organist choir director in my job. So I, you know, I do the whole package. And um, when I'm showing up to choir rehearsal, doesn't it's not that the rest of my life doesn't matter, but I have all these other things going on in my life. And oh my goodness, do I have all the other things going on in my life? But when I show up, I'm showing up primarily focused on my choir members' needs. I'm showing up, I'm thinking about their feelings. I'm thinking about their moods. I'm thinking about their difficult circumstances in life. And while I may 
you know, we have a prayer request time at the end. I may talk a little bit about anything I'm going through. That's not the primary focus. And it would be like professionally inappropriate for me to like turn that focus too much onto myself for the most part. Finally, one last, one last thing that makes this a uh, really, really difficult uh, to be ourselves. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about uh, churches and other um, places of worship, not as much about um, schools. Um, it's a, this is, here's another metaphor, which is that uh, the church or the congregation is a hospital for souls, a hospital for souls. And some folks start out in a ministry space working for a religious organization, uh, thinking that, wow, it's a church. It must be full of really good people. Or it's a, it's a synagogue. They must all be really wonderful. Or I'm working for a religious school with all of these, um, you know, all of these uh, religiously trained people as my coworkers. Uh, we're all going to be good people, right? I can trust these people to be good people. Um, and emphasis on like the, the quotes here. Um, and that is a, a big misunderstanding of, of what of what our religious organizations are, especially our congregations. Um, these are just places for people. And when we are expecting folks to be at some higher stand, higher standard, to be better than the rest of the people, uh, we're, we're really setting ourselves up for heartbreak. We're setting ourselves up for a lot of, um, a lot of misery if we expect the board of the church to operate with like a higher, I mean, I would like for us to be able to expect that the board of the church could operate at a higher level than the board of a non-religious nonprofit. But the reality is, is that is rarely, rarely the case. And I think um, this is ba based off of just you know, par partially my own experience, but in talking with people who've been around the block, have been doing this for decades and decades, and uniformly people will say, oh yeah, the church is full of people, not the church is full of good people. And the leadership of a church is just people. So when we're thinking about being ourselves, we're not, or we shouldn't be thinking about being ourselves in, in a kind of utopian, but I'm working with really great people who would never hurt me, who I can always trust, who would uh, you know, put the good uh, ahead of any other value. We're just working with people. And people are people and people are messy. People have difficult times and that includes us. We have difficult times, we're messy. And yet we're supposed to show up as, as these uh, faith representatives or as, as somehow adhering to a high moral standard if we're employed in a religious space, which most of us are. Very complicated. There's lots of layers here that are just really difficult, really difficult for being ourselves. So out of, out of that difficulty, out of this like, huh, I want to be myself, but there are a lot of reasons that it's difficult to be myself in this professional setting. We could go a lot of different directions here. We could talk about concepts for how to be ourselves. So we could talk about uh, social media. We could talk about being ourselves in the real time moment of playing your post loot at the end of the service. Like what does it mean to be ourselves in a uh, real time ministry of all those different places that we could go. I wanna take the rest of our time together to think about the foundation for being ourselves. And again, this is especially focused for people who are early career, uh, but I hope that for people who are later in the career that this is also helpful for you. When I think about workplaces and thinking about how to evaluate potential employers, uh, how to think about myself professionally I'm coming out of school and I'm entering into my first job, maybe my second job. I realized as musicians, many of us started when we were like babies, basically, you know, we're 10 year olds playing for churches. But if you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm coming into this uh, as, as an adult, right? Um, I think that there are three, kind of a three-legged stool for this foundation, this professional foundation for being ourselves. One of which is some basic self-knowledge and an understanding that we all grow and change over the years. What, you're, what is important for you in a workplace when you're 22 is maybe different. It's probably different from what's really important for you in your workplace when you're 42. It's not a 
bad thing. That's not a dishonest thing. That is just being a human being and what your priorities are will probably shift from 22 to 42. Another uh, leg on our three-legged stool here is having really close relationships that are not in that organization, that are not in your space of employment, but are outside of that. So genuinely close relationships, and this can include um, working with a just vulnerable relationships, working with a spiritual director, working with a therapist, um, but just in general, having close relationships that are not tied to that specific organization. And then the last part is being in a nourishing work environment. So for thinking about, I want to be myself in my workplace. How do I do that? We want that self-knowledge. We want those close relationships that are not in that workspace. And then we want to be in a workspace that nourishes us as people. How do we end up in a workspace that nourishes us who we are, for, for who we are, and um, really fits with that like intersection of our personal values and like employment? How do we find, how do we find this? Um, we can think about this in terms of actual hiring practices. And we could think about this in terms of like self-knowledge. So let's talk a little bit about hiring practices and then talk about uh, self-knowledge. So for thinking about this in terms of hiring practices, in my perspective, which again is influenced by talking to people in a wide range of employment settings, my perspective is that when you are in interviewing for a job, the onus is on you to be yourself from the get-go. And I say this because generally speaking, when we are um, interviewing for a job, either we're talking to one person, the one clergy person who is authorized to hire and fire us, or we're talking to a committee, probably of volunteers, maybe with a clergy person, probably with a clergy person on it, um, slightly different for a school. Um, but um, we're talking to people who are, um, in many ways, they're not like us. We're generally not talking to a bunch of other musicians. We're talking to maybe some other musicians, but they're not church musicians. They're like, you know, the, the middle school band director who got pulled into the hiring committee. We're talking to, uh, you know, the retired business person who got pulled into the committee. We're talking to people who aren't necessarily thinking about things the same way that we are. And so if we're showing up as ourselves from, from the beginning, we're at least doing our part in ensuring that this is a good fit with a potential employer, knowing that even for the hiring committee or the clergy person, they may be doing their best, but they may not really know how to do that. And they might not know how to evaluate um, whether, whether you're a good fit for the organization. So we have to show up. We have to show up uh, as ourselves from the beginning of a of an interview process. That's, I think, extremely important. Um, and of course, goes back to self-knowledge, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and then I, I think that we have to talk to as many people as we can about the organization. And that includes talking to people on the committee. And it also includes, or, you know, whoever is, is like in that actual hiring process. But I also think as much as we can, we should talk to current and previous staff. So if we can, this doesn't work in all settings, but if we can, we should, we should be talking to people who are engaged with that organization on the employee side of things rather than the volunteer or the student side of things because of how, um, you know, you're going to hear different things from like current employees than you will from, you know, the volunteers that make up the committee. It's the volunteers who make up the committee lovely and as well-meaning as they might be like they, they probably don't know what's happening in the the church office on a day-to-day -day basis or the school office on a day-to-day -to -day basis so having those conversations is extremely important because what you see in a job description man I just read a terrible job description the other day I know all about what's not where I work I was looking at this and I'm just like I know all about this job and wow that's a terrible job description. <laughs> like this happens all the time though, where churches put together or schools put together the job description. And it's like, so that kind of describes what's going on, but it doesn't really describe what's going on. So you want to have these conversations. 
So you want to have these conversations. You want to be um, being yourself as much as you can in a hiring process. And you need to be thinking about what's actually important to you. That is where we're thinking about that intersection of personal values with workplace dynamics. And when we think about personal values, clearly a big part of that is our religious and our political values. And this goes back to uh, what we were talking about earlier, like what flavor of Presbyterian. There, there are so many kinds of Presbyterian, right, y'all? And different priorities there, different um, interests there, different church structures. Think about what's important to you. And then if you're looking at a denomination that's different from what you're used to, especially if you're looking at a denomination that's different from what you're used to, think about how your religious and political values line up with whatever that church or that school, what is important there. This has historically been a big problem for church musicians um, because their sexual orientation or their political beliefs didn't line up with their employer. And we've seen this in court cases um, where even people whose um, extended family members um, did not fit with, with their employer's beliefs on what how things should be. And the employer can just hire and fire. Uh, and again, in the United States, like that's a legal thing to do. Um, but man, it's really, really tricky if you're employed in that kind of spot, as opposed to a place where your religious and political values are um, totally fine within the organization. Very important there. But that's not the only thing that's important. We want to think about like our musical priorities. Is it important that you um, only play the organ? Do you never want to play the piano? Do you uh, want to be able to work with a children's choir? Do you not want to work with a children's choir? Um, are handbells the hill that you die on? Uh, there are so many musical priorities. Are people going to uh, listen to the prelude? Are you going to be frustrated for the next 20 years because no one's going to listen to your prelude? These kinds of things really add up in the long run and are worthwhile thinking about ahead of time, knowing that, yes, of course, clergy person changes or it's going to change, you know, 20 years from now, who knows what's going to be happening in that congregation. But you don't want to set yourself up for misery. You know, if you're like, oh, actually, it's really important for me that I get to do X, Y, Z. You don't want to end up in a in an employment situation if you have the option um, that, that doesn't suit you in that way. You also want to think about your lifestyle priorities. Um, is it important that you have um, personal autonomy over the hours that you set? Many churches allow that even for full time musicians. Some churches don't. Is it important that you get to wear what you want? Uh, on a weekday, some churches, some schools, some churches, you know, have a have a wide latitude for what you can wear. Um, some of them do not want to see you in denim. And these things matter, maybe not to everybody, but certainly matter for some folks. Um, one thing to that I, I think is really um, useful, a really useful resource here, especially if you are um, kind of struggling to think about what's important for you. I think that the book, What Color Is Your Parachute, is really useful um, in that regard. And I, um, I, I confess, I confess, you know, I, I have this academic background, uh, musical background, and um, What Color Is Your Parachute is a many times over best-selling uh, career guide and has been for, you know, decades. And I just thought, oh, it's not going to be any good. It's just for the masses. It's not going to be good. Y'all, it's actually really good and really useful. Um, and will help you figure out in a more granular way what those values are. Is it important that you are working in a space with lots of light? Little things like that that you might not think about but are actually really, really important to you. That will help you figure that out. So we have talked about the crescent moon metaphor. We've talked about issues that have made it difficult to be ourselves. And we've talked about that three-legged foundation for being ourselves. So that is about what I had to say. And I think we're at time. So I'm hoping that we can open it up uh, for questions here. Elizabeth, would you like me to look at them? Would you like to look at them? How do we want to proceed from here? I'm happy to read the one question and comment that we have. But I just have to say Great. so much of what you said resonated with me because I served on a vestry and was on the search committee for hiring the director of music ministries. And uh, we like to think that we are in line with what our, our senior clergy may want, but in certain instances, 
we're not, we're thinking differently. And it's very, mm -hmm. very difficult to be transparent when you are representing the church. And then the mm -hmm. other thing that you said in the beginning, which just made me laugh, is like, remember years ago, um, when I went to a Presbyterian church in New Jersey and had a lovely relationship with our, uh, our rector, I happened to run into him in the liquor store one day. <laughs> just, oh my Lord, he's, he's buying wine. And we had a great conversation talking about single malt. But I, I have to tell you, you know, I feel so funny. Funny. This poor, poor guy just wants to go in and, and not be judged for yep. being a person. <laughs> so. You know, when, when I was interviewing people for my book, I talked to multiple um, evangelical uh, church leaders who had no problem with alcohol whatsoever, and they never drank alcohol in their hometown. They're like, I only drink alcohol on vacation because for them, it, it wasn't worth the potential distress that they were going to cause to a member of the congregation. They were just like, well, you know, this is part of my ministry. And y'all, that is an important thing to consider depending on where you're employed. Well, uh, now I'm an, I'm an Episcopalian and you know what they say about Episcopalians, but it's an old joke, so I won't even go there. Mm -hmm. So let's, <laughs> let's uh, look at this comment, just a comment. I've been hanging around on social media and have seen the drama people create by being too much themselves. For instance, a music director who gets into a quote unquote relationship with a choir member, then breaks it off, or an organist who comments publicly on Facebook about their pedophilic feelings. We are medical assistants in that hospital, which is the church. If we want to keep our jobs, we need to be better people, not ourselves. How do we avoid the pitfalls? Oh, that is a, that is a can of worms. <laughs> Right, right there. I think that's talking about uh, kind of two different things. One of which is like how we show up on social media. I have a whole chapter on it in here. Um, very, very tricky. Uh, and people come to all kinds of different self determinations for themselves about how they want to show up on social media, in large part, because as I see it, uh, social media creates, it's not just how I see it, some social media creates something called a parasocial relationship and a parasocial relationship is the appearance that you know someone because you see them on social media the the thought that you know famous actor so and so because you see them in the movie so you think that you know what they're actually like even though part of your brain knows that they're act they're an actor in a movie right another part of your brain thinks oh well i know what so and so is like because i've seen them in all these movies this happens on a smaller scale for individuals on social media where we think that we know people because we see them in these little tiny snapshots, these little edited snapshots on social media. So that's a, that's a whole thing. And then there's that, I think another part of that comment was around um, appropriate relationships with church members, um, congregation members. And that is um, very complicated and very tied to uh, the denomination in which you serve. It's tied to your own personality. Um, there, and, and I think it's also tied to generational norms um, what was normative or permissible or allowed 50 years ago is not the case today. And I think that, um, I think in most cases, that's a really good thing. There are a lot more professional boundaries, um, especially to protect vulnerable people in a congregation. That said though, like most of us musicians, not all of us, but most of us are not clergy people. So the standards that we are, um, held to in terms of those relationships are not the same we're not engaged in pastoral counseling for the most part. We are not in those positions of power over other church members and we're usually not privy to certain kinds of information that clergy are. Um, but that's a, I mean, that's a whole nother, a whole nother area to, to talk about. That's very, um, requires a lot of wisdom, I think, to just dis discern like what relationships are appropriate in your own setting. Personally, I, uh, I, I tend towards more conservatism, not politically, but in the sense of like, I, I don't swear online. I have firm boundaries with, with church members, much as I love them, they're not my buddies. Um, and that's, that's where I am. It's not the case for everybody, but that's, that's where I tend to tend to be largely based on my own person, based on my own personality. Thank you. We do have a question. Wow. This is, this is a, this could, you could, go on and on and on to answer this one. What kind of questions should you ask in an interview to determine the culture of a church? 
it's so hard to tell. It can seem like a good environment until you get signed on. <laughs> oh, that is so true. So true. Um, and I, I do think if you can, don't just talk to people in the church itself. Talk to people who've been at the church before. I realize that's not always possible. Um, I feel very blessed that in my last job, I was able to call up a previous music director and be like, so give me the scoop on this church. Um, and that, that was a, one of the reasons I'm working there now, actually. Um, I, I think, um, actually, I have a, a good resource on this on my website, uh, sarah-bariza.com. And it's like, I don't know, 80 questions to ask potential employers um, or for church committees to ask. It is a probably too much information. Um, but if you do like job search or something like in on my website, you'll, you'll be able to find that blog post. Um, but I think uh, questions around like cultural fit are important things, maybe hypothetical questions like what, if we're thinking about religious um, perspectives, what religious things are important. And maybe also um, thinking about like what's, what's uh, in a way non-negotiable for you, what's very important for you. And that um, can really vary depending on the job. Like I, I think, you know, I'm, I have a lot of capacity to deal with X, Y, and Z, but if A, B, and C aren't there, I'm not willing to work there, which, you know, speaks some, some to privilege, but also speaks some to being like, there's a lot of jobs for organists out there these days, y'all, um, at, least, at least where I live. Um, and I, I'm not willing to put up with, with the shenanigans of, you know, ABC, I'm like, oh, it's gotta be this way or I'm, I'm not there. And um, yeah, I think having those conversations and talking to a wide range of people as much as you can is really important. And if, and even um, in a church committee, you can always ask people on that hiring committee, hey, can I talk to um, a staff singer? Hey, can I talk to, um, you know, the youth leader? Can I talk to the sound person? And just have those conversations if you can. And also be wary if they don't want you to talk to people. That's a red, big red flag. Uh, thank you, comment. Thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering if you can speak to how you respond to congregants' projections onto you and the assumptions they make about you via their projections. Ah, I, I think you just have to roll with it. Like people are people and they're going to make assumptions all, all the time. I am, you guys can't see this. I'm very, very pregnant right now. And it keeps on happening just so adorably. People are like, oh, is this your first baby? And I'm like, I'm really old. I'm too old for this, but that's really lovely. Thank you. They're just projecting onto me. They're, they're you know, they're in their own space. They're, they're thinking their own thoughts. They're just being people. And unless those protections are actually really, uh, really harmful, you know, you can gently, you know, kind of laugh them off. But I think for them, at least, at least in my experience, they don't tend to be particularly harmful. They, they tend to be kind of sweetly naive, um, very, very often naive. Another comment, we are all at will employees. We better behave. I think I saved some guy his job by urging him to delete some really racy comments. And I'm just gonna add, when we were doing our search for our director of music ministries, we went to one gentleman who gave a great interview. Uh, we were very, very pleased. We were excited about him. And we saw some of his comments on his Facebook page. Yep. It made us yes. stop and think yes. about that. So you really do have to be careful. You really uh -huh. do. Think about a uh, post that you have regarding alcohol. Think about a uh, language that you use. Think about like, are you showing up online as a decent human being? Would someone like read your posts or your comments and think, oh, well, that seems like a decent person. Or would they think, wow, you got some anger management issues, buddy. Um, I know that we all see people show up like this online where it's just like, oh, wow, this is, you're not showing up, you're not being nice online. And church committees can, for the most part, find, find all of that. It's very easy to. Mm -hmm. Question, when subbing, how do you get the nerve to ask what the pay is? So many churches put up ads without specifics, and I am uncomfortable talking about money. Oh, man, I am with you there that I, I, I don't understand. Why don't Y'all, anytime I email someone, hey, would you like to blah, blah, blah? I'm like, and here's what the music is, and here's what the pay is. Just say it already. Uh, but for all the places that don't, I think that it is fair in that first, you know, it's, it, 
I think, you know, just ask. And at the same time, I have seen people on, on church committees be like, oh, well, that's just, you know, focusing on the money. And this just isn't, you know, we're a, we're a ministry here. We're a church. Um, you know what? Church employees have to eat. We have to pay the rent. We have to buy our cars. We have to pay for gas. Um, and, and our time is valuable. Our time is valuable, man. I was, I was, um, uh, hiring some additional vocalists for something and I did the math on how much they were being paid by hour. And I was like, <gasps> we have to pay them more. And I'm the music director. We're going to pay them more. Um, <laughs> because like musicians, like our, our work is valuable. Um, so my personal policy is just to ask up front, knowing that that's going to put some people off, but I, I we're, we're if you're being employed i think you have to know what the what the numbers are i agree with you and there's nothing wrong with that there's absolutely yeah. nothing wrong and it, you could phrase it as uh, i'm concerned you know i live a little farther away from this church i want to make sure that i will be compensated because of what is the mileage is going to be the gas whatever i mean there are a lot of ways you can phrase that so that it's coming out in a you know but you get your answer and generally speaking, if we're thinking about subbing, churches say like, you know, well, here's what we usually pay. And you can have in your mind, like, here's what you're comfortable with. And you just say, oh, what's your, what's your fee for, what's your fee for guest organists? There's no moral judgment implied in asking. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, how do you handle leadership situations where you've been appropriately vulnerable and appropriately and confidently yourself and congregants or other staff begin using that against you? Oh, my. Um, that That is a very complicated question. I think that um, that actually goes back to something I said earlier about close relationships. And part of that is that I think uh, we all of us need colleagues to talk with and depending on where we are in our career hopefully we also have mentors so we can go to them and be like hey like can you help me understand the situation someone who's outside of it um, and who knows us and trusts us hopefully um, and can help us make sense of whatever that situation is because it sounds like those types of situations aren't positive and I think probably all of us who have worked in churches for more than a nanosecond have had to deal with the church being full of people, people, and not just good people. There's always, always something y'all, um, despite everybody's best intentions, you know, people are going to be people. And well, oh, so go, go ahead. I was just going to say someone else also uh, commented regarding uh, being nervous about asking what they're paying rather than asking what the pay is. You can state what your fee is. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Even Y'all, that's even better. That's what I do for weddings because I don't like doing for weddings. <laughs> Sorry, I don't like doing weddings. But I was like, here's my fee. It's up here. I'll <laughs> show, show up if you pay me lots of money. <laughs> I have little kids. I don't want to do other stuff on Saturdays. Um, but 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 anyway, yeah, yeah. When we're when we're thinking about those settings where like we're behaving in an appropriate way and people are not, uh, it's it's it can be really, really, um, really, really difficult. Um, and um, can be personally damaging. Um, in my opinion, I don't think that if it's at all possible, I don't think we should stay in those kinds of situations um, if we can help it. I realize, as we said, we need to eat, we need a paycheck, um, but th those, those kinds of things can be really, uh, really problematic in the long term. Sarah, we did have a question. You referenced a document of questions you can ask uh, when you're interviewing yes. on your website, how do they find it? What is your, and I'll put this in the, in the handout, what is the, the your website address? It's sarah-bariza.com. And I'm, 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 I'm looking up the, oh, it's called a mega list of interview questions you might get, plus 34 questions for you to ask. Wow, that's very enthusiastic. Excellent, excellent. Yes, but so what I, what I just did was was type in into Google sarah-bariza.com job questions and that's what popped up 29 interview questions you might get plus 34. Um and then it, it has some links links to other stuff. Um pastor's leadership style, conflict in the church, how you've handled it. Those are good questions to ask. 
You want to know about the pastor's leadership stuff. So. Very important. Okay, well, the questions just keep coming. We've got one more that I think is a good one. How do you handle a minister who asks you to do tasks above and beyond the call of duty, like taking vocal dictation from them and creating charts for them? Oh, um, I think that that depends on your workplace and it depends on whether you are full-time or not. Um, I had something come up recently where they're like, oh, well, you can do this, right? And I said, well, that wasn't part of the deal when I was hired and my lifestyle hasn't changed. So no. Um, and I realized that that is coming from a place of privilege. It's coming from a place of, I'm not worried about losing my job by saying no. Um, but so with that being said, I think it is also on us to create our boundaries. That is a big deal about what a boundary is, is that we're the ones saying like, oh, this isn't, um, this isn't uh, for me to do. That's on us because even people aren't trying to like use you for the most part. They're just like, oh, well, this would be fun. This would be interesting. This would be cool. Hey, we can have this too. We're so enthusiastic, yay, Jesus. And it's like, yeah, actually I have a limited number of hours. <laughs> <laughs> um that said so it, so um you may be in a place where it's easy to state firm boundaries and have them respected and um and just go on and nobody's offended that's the ideal man it is so nice when that works out and if you're not in that kind of place and you're like looking at requests where you're like oh this is this is not my job one way to approach that um, and, you know, you can also Google this. It's not specific to church work or, you know, organists ministry. This happens in a lot of jobs where you're asked to do things that aren't your job. One way to approach that is to, is to phrase your response around the stated priorities of your job. So for instance, I could phrase it in terms of, wow, as I see it, the most important thing is that, you know, we have awesome organ music that, that people love to hear and that we have this really great cohesive, I call it a 60 minute soundscape. And I'm responsible for all the music in that soundscape every Sunday morning. It's important that all of that come together and that the choir be well rehearsed. And all, all of these other things that are, at least in my job, the core of what I do as the director of music at this church, that's the important stuff. Um, taking vocal dictation or whatever, Unless your job's really different from mine, that's not the important thing. Um, and if you can bring your response back to, it is important for me to have time to do this. And if I am giving all my time to X, Y, Z other things, I don't have time for the core of my job. That can be a way to frame your response in a way that people feel is respectful of them or respectful of you and reminds them like, what, what are you actually hired to do? Like, this is the important part of your job, not the other stuff. That is a great suggestion. Um, one more comment regarding interviewing. Another suggestion, sometimes it is more comfortable for the candidate and the interviewing committee to ask what the range of salary and benefits might be for a full-time position rather than ask what specific amount will be offered. Yes, 100% agree. Well, I think we have come to the end of the questions. Uh, what a wonderful, rich, and, and engaging uh, conversation you, we've had tonight. So blessed to have you with us, Sarah. And, uh, thank you. If and you thank you for everybody's it, questions. If you haven't read it, you can get this on, on uh, Amazon. And it's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. Uh, before I leave, I just want to remind you that we do have another webinar that I think you're going to enjoy on September uh, October 25th, excuse me, we are in October now, and that's at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and J.W. Arnold, who is our marketing and communication specialist, but also is an organist in Fort Lauderdale, is going to do a webinar on the weekend organist tips and tri tricks for part-time church musicians, so you can uh, register for that under our education tab on our website. Sarah, thank you again so much. My pleasure. Uh, just, just, we're so pleased, so grateful to have you with us. Take care, be well, and I will look forward to the next baby announcement. <laughs> oh, yes. Give, give it a few weeks. <laughs>